When I was in fourth year of university, it was a really tough one for me because I felt really dizzy and tired for most of it. So my doctor ordered blood tests, and a sample of my blood was driven from the nurse to a clinical laboratory for analysis. Like many laboratory analyses, a fluid like blood is passed between vials and containers by specialist laboratory staff. And this happens in many steps, so diluting, mixing, timing, filtering, carrying, and many more. The blood analysis showed that my thyroid levels were out, and I could immediately get a treatment for this common disorder and feel better. But how would this work if I lived in a place without that kind of infrastructure for healthcare? A place without electricity, without running water, without sterilization, without waste disposal, without roads for transport, and without trained technical staff. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could just take all the fluid manipulation functions of a laboratory and put them on a chip, a portable chip, so that we could give everyone a laboratory? Well, putting these fluid manipulations onto a little chip with channels in it is called lab-on-a-chip technology. These are not electronic chips. These are chips made out of a special silicone rubber with tiny channels in them for moving fluid around. But these chips are tiny, and they're often connected to a lot of laboratory equipment, so big precision pumps and their power supplies. So these tiny chips rely on electricity, which makes them not really portable for outside of the lab. So what else could we use to move fluid around? besides electricity and pumps. Capillary action is the way that fluid moves into confined spaces due to the forces of adhesion and surface tension. You may have noticed your drink rising up a little in a resting straw, as Leonardo da Vinci first did. Um, capillary action is also responsible for the way that paper towels absorb spills. It's also what moves fluids around in home pregnancy tests and for diabetics, blood glucose test strips. But there's been a growing interest in looking for ways to move fluids around in more refined ways. For example, George Whitesides at Harvard University, who has etched waxy patterns onto paper to move fluid. I no longer work in a lab, I work in a design studio called Science Practice. So we looked at creative ways to use everyday materials to manipulate fluid with capillary action. And we used stationary supplies. We used transparency plastic, tape, and absorbent paper like coffee filter. The simplest way to make one of these chips is to layer these materials. So this is a piece of plastic with a cut in it sealed on both sides by plastic tape. And the cut makes a channel or tube for fluid to flow in. We experimented with food coloring as a fluid, and as you can see, it gets drawn into that central channel. This video is in real time, and to me, it's really surprising how fast that fluid is moving on its own. Since this chip is moving tiny amounts of fluid around, it is essentially a microfluidic chip. Now, although made very simply by hand, these devices have some surprising capabilities. When we cut the end off a sealed chip with scissors, capillary action starts to work. That means that we could put multiple drops onto a chip that are only triggered to start flowing into the channels when needed, and that can be important for timing. We've started adding paper into the chips and found that we can control the speed of fluid flow simply by cutting the paper with or against the grain. We found that the chips can distribute a single droplet to multiple points so that you could test different properties of the sample at each point. We've achieved three-dimensional flow by layering tape and paper and having some interlayer holes. As you can see, the red and blue streams 
weave over each other without mixing. Three-dimensional flow makes it possible to fit more complicated designs in a compact area. These individual functions can also be combined to perform more complicated tasks. This is a microfluidic interpretation of a kidney. A chip like this could also perform some of the functions that happen in a, in a lab. But unlike traditional lab-on-a-chip technology, it doesn't need to be connected to any pumps or any electricity because it relies on the, just the physical properties of these materials. So by rethinking simple materials, we can put some of the functions of a laboratory onto a chip, a microfluidic chip. And we're most excited about seeing this applied to healthcare, where the chip would be a clinical laboratory processing medical samples. A chip like this could be used to diagnose disease where the patient is. Identifying the disease is the first step in treating someone and the first step in stopping it from spreading. So without diagnostics, medicine is blind. Chips like this would be cheap to manufacture by simply cutting sheets. And they would be small and light, so they would be easy to distribute. With the right chemical sensing elements, they could diagnose disease in a variety of biological fluids and environmental and agricultural samples, maybe. The outcome of a diagnosis could be displayed on the chip using color changes and patterns that appear. Another benefit of using simple materials is that it allows more people to experiment with microfluidics that wouldn't have had the resources before. So we're building a website. It's a, a catalog of microfluidic parts that can be built with simple materials. It will be completely accessible to non-scientists, and it might be interesting for farmers or teachers or anyone who wants to get involved with science. A toolkit like this could also be useful for prototyping microfluidics in the context that they will be used. Clinicians and scientists in developing countries have a better understanding of the technology that their community needs than anybody else, but they often have little to do with developing that technology. So maybe our toolkit could provide instructions for how to use everyday materials to test different designs and ideas for diagnosing health and environmental problems in their community. For example, an unsafe supply of drinking water. Prototyping diagnostics with locals could lead to better designs when they become regulated and manufactured. This means that instead of just being consumers of technology, locals could get more involved in the development of it. So, with all the exciting technological advances that happen every day, let's try to not overlook simple materials and to make sure that we are making the most of what we do have already. Simple materials have the potential to make a lot of impact by empowering more people to get involved in science and the development of technology, but also perhaps playing a role in giving healthcare to people around the world the type that helped me. Thank you.